Super. So now, with all of that as our frame, kind of where it took place, what we're, go what we're doing, how it's the direct path, and these basic qualities that will support us all the way along the way, now we get into the actual practices. So having done all that, what do I actually do with those attitudes of diligence, of mindfulness, of clear knowing? So breathing, someone to read. legs crosswise, crosswise, set his body erect, and establish mindfulness in front of him. Mindful he breathes it in, mindful he breathes out. Wonderful. So this is your first practice. Right? How, in regard to the body, do you abide? Right? Abide, beautiful old word. Right? How do you kind of hang out with, rest in? Right? He doesn't just say, hey, pay attention to the breathing. He says, <laughs> How do you abide in the contemplation of breathing? Which means, how do you hang out in it for a period of time? How do you live there in mindfulness of breathing? Well, first you put yourself in a good place, right? What's the, what's the first good place? The forest, the root of a tree, right? And just that, you know, this is, this is a teacher who spent most of his entire life teaching outside, who according to the myths, was born under a tree. His mother was walking in the garden, felt a birth pang, held onto a branch, and then boom, the Buddha popped out. <laughs> right? Tell them, bada bing, bada boom, bada bing, bada Buddha. Um, tell the midwives that easy birth story. And, and later on, when the Buddha's mythology got more sort of hyperbolic, the myth became the Buddha slides out to take seven steps where a lotus flower appears under each of his feet, stands up and proclaims, brand new newborn infant, you know, here I am, master of the world and all that I see. Like, boom. <laughs> I am here. You know, it's like, okay. You know, although, you know, if I imagine myself, maybe from a past life, being a new mother, and there comes, I could totally imagine, like, there comes my baby, and wow. Here I am, like, so there's just a myth about how that might have happened. And it's a little wild. In the Theravada, mostly it just says, she felt the pain, and out he came. No pain. So then the Buddha um, is born under a tree. He attains enlightenment under a tree. When he just finally decides, oh, the middle path, I have a hunch how this is going to work, he goes to the foot of a tree. Right? And he teaches for his whole life. When it comes time for him to die, uh, he dies because he ate some, uh, some, some bad food, uh, some food that had gone off. Uh, but, he, but his practice was to eat what, he, what was offered to him, and he would never refuse food. So he doesn't let any of the other monks eat the food. He says this is food fit only for a Buddha. He eats it, orders the rest of the food to be buried, so no one will eat it. And then he sets out walking for, for home to try to reach his hometown before he dies. He gets halfway there and lies down between two sala trees in the forest and lies down on his right side and dies in the forest. So, excuse me. I like the story a lot. So each of these kind of pillar moments in his life happen under a tree. And this is a man who has spent his life walking outside. So go to the forest, sit under a tree is what he says perfect place. Maybe if you don't have that, you go to an empty hut, right? So a clean, well-lit room. Sitting down, here's, here's the asana portion right, of the instruction. Sitting down, folding the legs crosswise, body erect, establishing mindfulness in front of him. So this in front of him is a, is a contested phrase. What does it actually mean? Um, the word used is mukha, like at the mouth. And so some commentators who were really fond of breathing at the nose tip say, oh, it means establish mindfulness at the tip of the nose, at the lips. Um, some other people say, no, 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 it just means bring mindfulness to the fore. Bring mindfulness to be the central thing that you're doing. Um, and then some people say, oh, establish mindfulness in front of him. The, the Southeast Asian meditators who really preferred meditating with the belly 
movement of the breath, say, oh, it means establish mindfulness in the front of the body. But what it literally says is bring mindfulness to the front. So I basically think that means, yeah, sit down, start being mindful. I don't know. Maybe I'm overly simplistic. But that's what I think it means. Establishing mindfulness. For me as a practitioner, really it means I have to intend to do it. I don't just sit down and kind of space out. Actually, I often do that. But when I'm being mindful, I don't. I sit down and I say, oh, now I'm going to be mindful. That's it. You just have to decide to do it. Mindful breathing in, mindful breathing out. So the first instruction is know when you're breathing in and know when you're breathing out. Okay. So pretty simple. But how often through the day am I completely unaware of whether I'm breathing in or out? Couldn't tell you, right? So right at this moment, are you on an in-breath or an out-breath? or in between. Let's read the next paragraph somewhere. Breathing, breathing in long to nose, I breathe in long. Breathing out long to nose, I breathe out long. Breathing in short to nose, I breathe in short. Breathing out short to nose, I breathe out short. To train self, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. To train self, I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. To train self, I shall breathe in calming the bodily formations. To train self, I shall breathe out calming the bodily formations. Wonderful. So, four basic breathing practices. And they go from sort of simple to slightly more complex. First practice. Just know whether you're breathing in or out. That's all. So as a practice, you could sit in meditation. And as the breath comes in, so very quietly the mind just, you can say, in. Just to acknowledge, oh, here, it's, here just comes the in-breath. As you begin the out-breath, just very quietly in the mind, out. Just to know, oh, there's the out-breath. Okay. He says, oh, that's, that's the first practice, all you have to do. Then give it a little more detail. Oh, is the breath long or short? Breathing in long, she knows I breathe in long. Breathing out long, she knows I breathe out long. Breathing in short, breathing out short. Knows it. Right? So mindfulness is that knowing. So not just breathe in long, ah. But breathing in, oh, that was a long breath. That was a shorter breath. Right? The first two are just noticing. Notice whether you're breathing in or out. Notice the length or shortness of the breath. Then the word training comes in. She trains thus. So the first two, maybe they don't take training. Maybe you could just notice, right? You don't have to train yourself to breathe long or short. It just happens. Now a little bit of direction of the breath comes in. She trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. So my teacher Tanasaro Bhikkhu interprets this to mean that the, that the kind of breath, which we would say the kind of pranayama that the Buddha is recommending, is a full body breath. So, and there's... Uh, there's only 2,000 years of, of you know, uh, very precise discussion as to exactly what this means. You know, oh, do you tend to the breath in the belly? Do you tend to it in the heart? Do you tend to it in the tip of the nose or in some other chakra? Or in how do you do it? Right? Many monks have commented on this, commentaried on this for a long time. But here's what it says: breathe in, experiencing the whole body. It sounds fairly straightforward to me. When I breathe in, can I feel the whole body breathing? In? Breathing out, can I feel the whole body breathing out? And then you do that as a training, so cultivating the whole body breathing. She trains thus, I shall breathe in calming the bodily formation. That's a little bit of a kind of arcane translation, but that's the way it's always translated, um, the bodily formation. Essentially, breathe in, calm, breathe out, calm. Some commentators say that means train toward calming the breath itself, like making the breath subtler and subtler, um, and you can practice in that way, and that's a very sweet training. Like, oh, not just letting the body breathe how it wants, but really, okay, calmer. How do you calm even more? Or just how do I calm the body? Breathing in and out, relax the whole body. Oh, I'm tensing. I'm trying really hard to sit upright. Like, oh, I breathe out, calming the body. And it's a training, like the other one, right? So these first four, then, breathing practices. As you bring it into your meditation practice, you can start with the first one 
and expand into the others, or you can go right in kind of wherever it makes sense to you. Okay. That basic meditation training. And then this last paragraph basically says, basically repeats, um, giving a little simile for how you would know what you're doing while you're doing it. So, Shannon, why don't you read the last little paragraph there? Just as a skilled turner or his apprentice, when making a long turn, knows, I make a long turn, or when making a shir- short turn, knows, I make a short turn. So too, breathing in long, she knows, I breathe in long. Why don't you b- read the whole paragraph that, that it um, Breathing in short, she knows, I breathe in short. Breathing out short, she knows, I breathe out short. Um, she trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. She trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. She trains thus, I shall breathe in calming the bodily formation. She trains thus, I shall breathe out calming the bodily formation. Beautiful. So here's the first example of that whole passage is just repeated. Right. Nice way to remember it. Do it. So let's take a one minute meditation. Just sit up tall. Maybe three minutes. I think I forgot to help her breathe out. Ah, she can do it. So <laughs> sitting tall, establishing mindfulness in front. Diligent, clearly knowing, mindful, setting aside grief and discontent for the world. Breathing in long, breathing in short, knowing the in-breath and the out-breath. First, just knowing. Here's the in-breath, the out-breath. Here's a long breath or a short breath, just seeing what comes. She trains thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing the whole body. Breathe out, experiencing the whole body. She shall breathe in, calming the body, the bodily formation. She shall breathe out, calming the body, the breath, the bodily formation. If you haven't taken a moment with each, with any one of the four basic instructions, give it a moment just now. What's it like to train calming the bodily formation? What does that mean? What's it like to breathe in or out, experiencing the whole body? To notice the long or short breath. To know in the most simple way Just the breath coming in or out. So any reflections on that as a practice? Anything you notice just now? If these instructions are different from other breathing practices you've, you've done, breathing mindfulness or meditation, or any questions in the text? It's different from an asana practice where the in-breath is to create toughness and heat. 
Yes. 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 And it's quite different from really almost all of the pranayama that we'll do in yoga class, where we're really manipulating the breath in order to achieve certain shifts in the body that are, that are valuable. Those pranayama, in a way, are, are among the most wonderful preparations for this kind of practice, because if the body isn't bright and awake, it's one reason why I love doing that hour of yoga before sitting like this, and, or before meditating. Because if the body's not bright, right, we sit and start to calm and quiet. What's my usual association with calming and quieting the bodily formation? <laughs> you know, and falling asleep is a very strong tendency of mine personally. And so, you know, I have sat in countless, you know, meditation retreats just nodding off. I just nod off because my system actually um, is not very good at deeply calming without falling over the line into sleep. That line is really blurry for me, and it's different for everyone, but that's a particular kind of, you know, demon of mine, is that little boundary. And so sometimes I have to apply a lot of atapi, a lot of tapas, when I'm practicing, you know, sometimes, I, lots of times I just can't do it, I just nod off. And so eventually I wake up, I'm like, oh, I was asleep, now I'm awake, and there's more brightness. Sometimes if I really want to work with it, I'll, you know, I'll be in the hall, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, like, I will not. I'm like, you know, toothpicks. <laughs> I will not fall asleep. Like Bodhidharma, who brought the Dharma from India to China, and it's said that he sat facing a wall for nine years, waiting for a student to come by who could actually receive the Dharma from him. And he got exasperated with falling asleep while he meditated. So he, mythically, tore off his eyelids, <laughs> threw them out the cave, out the mouth of the cave. They landed on the ground and up sprouted the tea plant, Camellia sinensis, the plant that keeps us awake. <laughs> How nice, right? And then if you see the, the paintings of Bodhidharma in the Chinese brush tradition, he always has these big bug eyes, because <laughs> he has no eyelids, and a, and, a, and a big beard, apparently. And he was considered like, you know, why did the bearded one come from the West? It's an old Zen koan. It's like, I mean, it means Bodhidharma. And he's fierce, nine years, no eyelids. He's just like, <laughs> <laughs> these big bug eyes. So, so, um, so he apparently was having trouble with that instruction as well to calm the body formation. <laughs> so I at least feel like I'm in good company. Um, but so this pranayama, this breath practice, is not so much about using the breath to create energy or to create that vitality. The Buddha kind of says, have your vitality at the get-go, and then use the breath to calm and settle the whole thing. And what you're going for, and what this practice leads to, if you take just this practice a long way, and you can, just go with Go home now. Don't do any of the other foundations of mindfulness. Just take the breath practice. Come back in 10 years. Tell me how it's going. You can do breath all the way. What that practice of calm the bodily formation leads to is it leads into very, very deep states of stillness. And in one of those states, uh, the fourth jhana, so the very deep concentration state, um, the physical breath actually stops um, entirely. And the body kind of breathes in a very passive way through the skin. And this is fairly documented. Because the heart rate can stop. The heart rate slows down greatly and can stop entirely, which is quite incredible mm -hmm. to calm the bodily formation to that degree, mm -hmm. right? Those yogis in India that do kind of yogic stunts of like, okay, lock me in a coffin, come back in a year. They're, this is what they're doing, right? Is focusing the mind so deeply and calming the, that formation so deeply that the that the system like really kind of shuts down. They go kind of into possum mode, essentially. So you don't have to take it that far. Most of us um, <laughs> you know, won't in this lifetime. It's not necessary to. But the thing to pay attention for in those last two instructions is this moment. And you can really feel it in your meditation where like, OK, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention. But there's the moment where I turn my will, my intention toward calm. And it's quite intentional, like now I will calm. And you just kind of go, and one of my teachers, Jaya, she says, she says, lean back a little, like drop your tailbone down, lean back like you're leaning into a really comfy sofa, right? And in yoga, often when we're sitting, we're like upright, upright, lift the sternum, drop the shoulder, you know, whoa. And that's great. But it's not really calming the bodily formation. It's doing something else. And the Hatha yogins were doing something else. They were like, yeah, I get that fire going. But in these instructions, it's like, yeah, that's great. 
That's atapi. That's tapas. That's vigor, diligence. Drop it, drop it, drop it. Calm it, calm it, calm it, calm it. And sometimes I'll do the practice where I'm breathing, mindful of breath, mindful of breath. And sometimes I'll just be like, I am not going to breathe in again until the breath naturally comes by itself. And you let the breath just like, and just wait until it naturally comes in. And the breath can settle into this very quiet mode. And it's pretty bliss, pretty nice, pretty blissful to get there. So, so the Buddha actually says train toward that. Right? That's something to lean toward. Um, I, get, I get just a, a question or maybe a comment. If, does it calm you because the tendency is always to do something? And so when you just watch it, and you're not doing anything to it, you're just watching it. Is it naturally calm? Mm -hmm. It's and it kind of, in a way that kind of explains why it's such a foundational teaching because it kind of, at least to me, in terms of yoga or meditation or even just you know sort of living your life on a day to day basis without you know you know right. an, an oscillator, you just observe stuff and not be always trying to fix it or not always be trying to change it and just. Yeah. It, it, you said something earlier before the discussion about um, mindfulness is watching it. Um, a wise effort is what sticks with me. I, I, yeah. I thought, yeah, that's because I can never get the next step. It was like, yeah, I'm watching it, but like I can't just always just watch it. Like sometimes I have to be paying attention. Yeah. But anyway, that's just something that, that, that kind of makes sense yeah. about the breath thing. That you would become calm because we're just you don't have to do you don't have to do anything you just you just observe and and there's a way in one of my early meditation retreats I went in to see my teacher um, Robert Hall at the time and um, and I was really having this experience like I'm not doing anything it's just this kind of funny body and it's just breathing all the time it just keeps breathing and I went in and he said how is it and I said it breathes itself you know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to try to breathe. It just does it. So all you have to do is kind of hang back a little bit and, and, and watch. So this is huge in practice. All day, every day, doing, doing, doing. What happens if I just stop doing so much? Still stuff is happening. Thoughts come and go. Sounds come and go. There's, there's enough to watch. right? The, the kids keep playing. Just sit back. There's the breath. Now in the text... You get two different verbs, though. For the first two practices, right? Um, she mindful she breathes in, mindful she breathes out. So just attending, not doing anything. Breathing in long, she knows I breathe in long. So the verb is knowing, right? I just know it. I know that that's long breath. I know that that was a short breath. Then the verb switches. She trains thus. So you bring in a little wise effort. And wise effort is the training to cultivate wholesome states and uncultivate unwholesome states. So, oh, okay, I'm observing. Observing is fabulous. Now that I have a foundation of observing, I can actually begin to guide the process a little bit, but in this very gentle way. Right? It doesn't say, now you know, she trains you know, drawing the sky breath into the belly and drawing the earth breath up and mixing them around three and a half times and pulling. You know, that will come later. Right? People will get really into this amazing kinds of doing that light up the body in incredible ways. The Buddha is very simple. He says, no, train thus, calmly. In other words, when I just watch, there's still going to be a lot of habit and tendency to run around. So, oh, I'm just observing. My breath is kind of ragged. And I'm kind of quick, or I'm breathing up here, or I'm a little scared, or I'm tense in this way. Observing, observing, observing. Notice all those tensions. Notice, oh, here's... Here's my normal breath. It's not very deep, or it's not very comfortable, or whatever. First, you have to notice it. Oh, all my breaths are short breaths. Or like, oh, all my breaths are long breaths. I'm working too hard. I heard that you had to breathe like this. So I meditate like that. I sat one retreat down at Vajrapani one year. 10-day retreat, late, late summer. Um, crickets, mosquitoes, redwood, beautiful. Right behind me was this guy. 10 full days, all day, every day. 
<laughs> I'm like, <laughs> wow. Uh, at the end of the retreat, he was a totally nice guy. We're talking at, at the end. He was like, um, at a certain point, I realized I was breathing really loud. I hope that didn't bother you. <laughs> you know. I was like, yeah, I could hear it. He's like, yeah, I've never done this practice before. Um, at some point, they said, don't really try hard on your breathing. I was like, oh, I'm not trying. So um, the Buddha says, train thus. Experience the whole body breathing. Oh, I was only breathing up here. What about down here? What about here? What about here? What about all the way down to the feet? Breathing, whole body. It's a whole different breath, whole body. And then calming the whole thing. So that's your first training then. It's just inclined toward that, inclined toward the whole, including the whole body, and inclined toward calm. Super. So I just want to read the last, the, ref the refrain, and we'll read it over and over, because it comes, it comes back after every specific practice. He sets it up, diligent, mindful, fully aware, and then gives you the practice, breathe in these four ways. And then comes this refrain, which kind of says, this is, and this is how to do it, and this is how you'll do all the practices. So um, let's have a volunteer just to read the refrain. In this way, in regard to the body, he abides contemplating the body internally, or he abides contemplating the body externally, or he abides contemplating the body both internally and externally. He abides contemplating the nature of arising in the body, or he abides contemplating the nature of passing away in the body or he abides contemplating the nature of both arising and passing away in the body. Mindfulness that there is a body is established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how, in regard to the body, he abides contemplating the body. Beautiful. So this refrain will come back after every one of the practices. In this way, in regard to the body, contemplating the body, this one's a little complicated. I'm not going to go into a big discourse about it. Internally, externally, or both. One sense is like, um, sense your body from the inside. Like, oh, what does it just feel like? Or sense your body almost like as if you're looking at it from the outside. Like, oh, yeah, breathing in. I can sort of the belly go like this. And it's like this. A different interpretation. Um, in the commentaries, I don't actually think this is what the Buddha meant, but he might have, he did at some points. The commentaries say, it means you can be mindful of your own breath and you can be mindful of someone else's breath. Meaning, some commentators said, you've developed your psychic power to the extent that I could feel you breathing. Right? But in a sense, um, you know, or both, that interprets a few ways. Maybe we'll talk about internal and external a little more next time. Um, in the refrain, it points to how the practice is not only a training, but it inclines toward insight. So it inclines toward wisdom about the body. It says, oh, um, contemplating the body, knowing arising in the body. So how does the breath appear? Where does it come from? Or passing away in the body, where does the breath go? So whatever I was attending to, whether it becomes breath or any of the, the score of things we'll attend to, you notice how things arise and how they pass away. And this is the core reflection that leads to the insight into impermanence, which is at the center of what leads to wisdom and freedom. Right? Notice how things appear and how they disappear. So you're not just training to calm the, the breath in the body, but you train also noticing, oh, this pain in my low back, it just appeared. Where did it come from? I don't know. There it is now. Oh, now it's gone. And the wisdom starts to grow. Oh, everything comes and goes. Nothing lasts. Everything is in this flow of coming and going. And so the refrain will say, after every practice, notice how it came, notice how it went, notice how it both came and went. And then even and then it gets super simple, and I love this, right? All of that's very complicated, great. How about just knowing that you have a body at all, right? <laughs> Mindfulness that there is a body is established. This is great, right? All of this, like, have these qualities and have this and train in this way and all this. It's like, okay, okay. Do you actually know that you have a body? That there is a body. It's not even you have. Mindfulness that there is a body. How often do we even forget that? I'm going around. I'm being whatever I'm being. Oh, there is a body. And he says, mindfulness that there is a body is established to the extent 
necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness. In other words, you just have to have that sense enough to have, uh, and we can talk about these terms more later, bare knowledge, right? No bail. See things just as they are, bare, right? And, con and continuous mindfulness. And again, we'll talk more about continuity. The thing that makes mindfulness work is, is continuity, keeping it going moment to moment. And, and again, this is so beautiful. And she abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. So somehow this practice of attending and calming and knowing that there is a body leads to independence, leads to being free from things. Um, the translation is exactly the same here. Independent, not clinging to anything in the world. So that is how she abides contemplating the body. So that's the beginning of the instructions for this week as you practice. Um, I encourage everyone to meditate, uh, to sit in meditation using these exact instructions if you want to, um, for as, as for as much as three minutes or as little as several hours a day, whatever you prefer. Um, Twenty. Don't be lazy. <laughs> and if you have a regular practice of meditation and mindfulness of breath, it takes at least some time to, to really try out these four specific instructions. What's it like to first just attend to the in and out breath itself, and then to the length of the breath, and then the whole body breathing, and then to calming the breath? Because it's, this, it's a very sensible and beautiful process to go from this fairly gross level, yep, breathing in, to something fairly calm or fairly subtle, this kind of calming through the whole body. So you can try that on in your practice. And if you're a, if you're a yoga class goer, try it on in yoga, right? I'm, through the, you come to my class, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, right? The yogi practices, knowing the in-breath, knowing the out-breath, right? What is all of asana except contemplate the body, you know, knowing that there is a body? Okay, I, do, I, have to, I, have, I have to go to all these crazy, you know, sweaty classes just to know that I have a body at all. Do what it takes. <laughs> when is the best time to meditate? Um, whenever it works for you. Um, uh, some people like early in the morning. Some people like quite late at night. Middle of the day, I don't hear being very popular because we're kind of doing a lot of things. But basically, whenever it works for your schedule. Uh, anything else before we close for today? I was noting that... Um, it says there is a body. Is it constructed in the Pali as a body and not her body, his body, my body? Right. There's not a possessive mm -hmm. in this sentence, body, as far as I body. know. Okay. Um, and I don't, sp I don't speak Pali to that level, so I mostly right. only know what the books <laughs> right. tell me. Right. <laughs> but Analayo is pretty literal, and, and uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi is as, as well. There is a body. Um, and of course, if we, we want to get into to you know, deeper insight, the question would be, is it yours? Right, right. Like, do you own it? Right. Right? If you owned it, presumably you could make it do things, mm. like stay healthy. But then you're clinging uh, to your body. And of course it's not going to work, right? Okay. So um, can, you, can you just make your body feel good? You know? So is it yours? You know? So that's just an open question for now. Whose body is it actually? Um, the Buddha says, all you need to know is that there is a body to so start off with. That's enough to go. Okay, done. Uh, and, then you abide in it. and then you abide in it. Yeah, just hang out there. It's your home. All right, let's sit tall to close. If you like bringing palms together, and close with a traditional blessing that if any merit or well-being or blessing should arise as a result of our practice today through the kindness and joy that comes from mindfulness and seeing clearly we give rise in ourselves to the desire that that happiness and well-being and blessing be spread out to everyone everywhere so whatever blessings come to us we give them away for the benefit of everyone May we each be free, seeing clearly, 
deeply intimate with this body in this moment and the everyone everywhere. Be happy and at peace, safe from harm and completely free. So let's sing Om again one more time to close. Beautiful. Touching thumbs to the third eye. May we see clearly. And bowing, remembering the source of everything. Jai Ma. Rising. Is that light in everyone? Namaste. Mm -hmm. All right, it's a little funny to do namaste at the end of a Buddhist day. It's a little mishmash here. Maybe we'll do some Buddhist invocations next time. Really happy to see everybody here, um, to meet those of you that I don't know, and to see those of you that I do know again. Um, I'm totally uh, excited about this text. Happy to see you next week. So four Saturdays. Um, for those of you that that uh, bought a drop-in for today. Um, if you want to go ahead and pay for the whole thing, which is cheaper, you can go and do that at the front, um, and Jackie will will maneuver that in uh, for you. And I hope I'll see everyone next week at 2.30. Um, if you have to miss one, it's fine. Just come back in. Um, you can watch the podcast online or whatever. I'll figure out how to put it somewhere. And have a wonderful week. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs>